That, you don't get the true story. Did you know that? I remember growing up and watching these television programs about families. And it would be a family where the, the dad would come in and talk to the daughters, and the mom would be understanding, and they all liked each other, and everybody got along, and everybody understood each other. And I would think, I don't have a family. I just have an awful family because we don't do that. And you know, I have a pretty good family. It's just, I was see, seeing an unrealistic view. Now, I think you could have a good family, but it was making me dissatisfied with the family that I had because I was filling my mind with this unrealistic view of what family was. Um, I never had a dad that talked to me or even cared what I thought. He just said, this is what we're going to do, and this is what we did. He didn't know how to talk to his daughters, but I still could appreciate and love my dad. But that was a whole other story. But Sometimes it's because um, if we watch television, one of the things they do is they overemphasize the outward beauty and they overemphasize the intelligence. In other words, if you are not a gorgeous, knock dead, beautiful woman who could beat up every man on the street and you know more than every guy, you are nothing. Do you, do, if you ever watch these television programs, the women are everything. The men just kind of tag along. The women are everything. Women are beautiful. Women can fight. They can beat up these big, huge, tough men that no woman can ever really beat up, ever. Um, and, and so sometimes when you feel like, oh, I'm not very athletic, I'm oh, not very uh, beautiful, um, I could never figure out all the stuff this woman figured out. Or it places a too much emphasis on the value of outside employment and it downgrades just being a mom and being a good wife. And, and, and you start thinking that to, to be a mom and a good wife would just not be a very high calling. And so when you do get a family and you are home and you are loving babies and you are raising the family, you feel like you're kind of a second class citizen. And so you don't feel good about yourself. Um, sometimes, um, I know for me, if I watch too much, there's a movie called Fixer Upper. I know your mom's ever watched that. And, and they take this old, awful house, and they, they'll go in and fix it up, and they make it so beautiful. And then they bring in, a, they, they come in and bring all these beautiful decorations, and it's a perfect house. And I, I live in a very beautiful home. But sometimes if I watch too many of those shows, I'll walk in my house and go, this room needs fixer upper, and I would be dissatisfied and not like my abilities to decorate because I am not Joanna Gates or whoever the other people are because I, I'm not that great at that. And so I will, I can major on what I'm not good at and realize that God has given me different gifts and God has given you different gifts. But watching too much TV and comparing yourself with unrealistic people. Do you know how many, I don't know how many houses they flop before they can actually film one. But they don't show you the flops, do they? They only show you the house that turned out. And we have a lot of things that turn out in life, but we can really major on the flops and not like ourselves. But um, we compare ourselves with those who have strengths that we do not have. When I was a teenage girl, I had my best friend's name was Linda Murray. And Linda Murray was very smart. I mean, she was very smart. And she was musical. And she was athletic. And her family played a leadership role in the community. And if I dwelt on her strengths, I could feel very insecure and inferior. Now, let's turn it around on my side. I happened to be pretty popular in high school. I, she was not really all that popular. I had a boyfriend. She did not have a boyfriend. I had a sweet mom who was kind to everyone, even though she wasn't really known in the community. And, and she, everyone loved coming to my house because they loved my mom. Now, if she loved on my strengths, she could feel inferior and feel like she fell short. Do you see how it depends? If you compare yourself to other people, you can feel insecure and you cannot like yourself. Because we never compare 
ourselves to the things that they're not very good at. We compare ourselves to the things that they're really good at. Run away is going to be proud, and that's another lesson. Um, or we get these feelings of inadequacy and inferiority, and they're often, sometimes they're rooted in how we were treated as children. And I do know those are special cases where maybe you can come from a family that your mom knew how to love, or your dad knew how to love, and so there was a lot of negative in your home. And so you have a, not a good feeling about yourself, because when you're little and you're told something and you're treated this way, I was at the grocery store the other day, and I just heard a mother telling you, you are so stupid! And just yelling and screaming these awful things at her child. Now, I don't know what the child had done, but I don't think a mother should ever tell the child that they're stupid. Now, I might look at them and say, that was a very bad thing you did, but I'm not going to tell them, you are very bad. So there's a difference. So maybe there were times in your life where you were talked down to and it's because your mom didn't know better and she didn't know how to raise children. And so you have this view of yourself that isn't a good view. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, they, do you know there were great men in the Bible who guided us in a great way? Who were, and had, they, they did not like themselves. They felt like they were inferior. And so we're going to talk about them. God, the first man is called Moses. You've all heard about him? Who knows about Moses? All, of, all your life you hear Sunday school stories about Moses. But Moses, let's talk about, oh, I forgot to tell you that. Maybe one of the struggles is like, yes, little stuff. Where is it, little stuff? I need to do this. Write that, those words, and I highlighted it. 
you know what? A lot of you can sit and think, I don't, I don't really think God would ever use me because then you need to fill in the blank. But you know what? God doesn't need your abilities. God doesn't need your strength, your beauty, your intelligence. He needs you just to be And that's what he needed of Moses. And number two, we must trust in God's ability and stop focusing on our inabilities. If, do you know, to be, to be very honest with you, none of us are really worth much. God says we're just dirt, we're just a, like a dirt clock. And he breathed into us and he wants to make something out of our lives. Um, but he, we need to realize that God is able, not us. And Moses overcame his insecurities by trusting in God's abilities instead of focusing on his inadequacies. Are you inadequate in a lot of areas? Yeah. Am I inadequate in a lot of areas? Yes. But you know what? If God asks us to do something, we can do it. Because it doesn't matter how good or how, how, how strong or how smart or how pretty we are. It matters on how available we are. So that's one person that God used in spite of a lot that was going against him. There's another man named Paul in the Bible. And you read about him in Romans. And um, in Romans 12, 3, it says, For I say, I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. You know what Paul said? He said he realized that his strengths, every strength he had, came from God. See, Paul did have a lot of strengths. He was well educated. He was he was able to stand up and persuade people. But one of the reasons God was able to use him was not because of that. It was because he realized that it was that his strengths that he did have came from God. And number two, this is just kind of an introduction here. Paul felt weak and fearful about the abilities, um, but his, his abilities, but confident in God's abilities. In 1 Corinthians 1, 3-5, he says, And I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that you, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, when we do right and we live for God, our weaknesses, um, in our, with our weaknesses, God's strength will shine through. That's always happened. Our humble love for God and a humble passion to do the right thing is what will make the difference, not our abilities. Um, it's not our, our cleverness or our wisdom or our beauty or our talents that God, God needs. God is the one who's going to do what he wants to do with us. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all, you know this verse, I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things because I'm pretty. I can do all things because I'm strong. I can do all things because I have a good personality. I can do all things because I'm the perfect way. No, I can do all things through Christ, who which strengthened me. Um, so we just want, I want you to know that God is not looking for a perfect person. He's not looking for a perfect girl. He's looking for someone who says, God, I'll just give you what I can. And 50 years ago, 37 years, 47 years ago, oh, I think I'm a little smaller. 47 years ago, when I gave my heart to the Lord and said, God, whatever I am, you can have. God has had, has had a whole lot to work with. But he's had all of it. And that's what God wants you to do. He doesn't want you to focus on what you are, who you are, how good you are. He wants you to give him who you are. And he wants to do something very special with your life. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10 says, For I am the least... Oh, I did, I, did I give you that? Did you get that on your paper? 
He felt weak and fearful about his abilities, but confident in God's abilities. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am. Let me tell you one reason Paul should have felt very inadequate. And he should have felt, he should have been out, he should have looked in the mirror and he should have said, I think I don't like myself. Do you know what Paul did before he was saved? He captured Christians, he ripped parents from their children, and he threw them to the lions to eat. Those were his memories of what he was. And do you know what? He didn't let oh, that's the verse I just read. He didn't let insecurities about his past prevent him from doing God's will. You girls haven't lived a very long time yet, but some of you may have some regrets about past things that you have done. Don't let Satan use those things to keep you from being what God wants you to be and knowing that you are special to God. Did that keep God from using Paul? No, he's one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. But he was he was he had to overcome that. And he had to say, I have to forget those things which are behind. I have to press toward the mark of the price for the price of a high calling of God. And and he said here, let me see what this verse is. And he said, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know what Paul said? He said, the more I forget about me, the more I stop worrying about how I feel, the more I stop worrying about how people treat me, the more God can use me. And the more it will help me understand how much I need God. So number four, he learned to accept and view his weaknesses as instruments to increase his dependency upon God. Do you know, sometimes God doesn't let us be perfect in our appearance, are perfect in our intelligence, are perfect in our, you know, I've met people who, they're so thoughtful. I don't think I've ever met people like that, but they, re, they listen and they remember what someone's favorite is and they never forget. And then when it's a special day for that person, they go and buy it and give it to them. Just really exceptionally thoughtful people. And I sit there and think, And that if I let God do it through me, we'll be all right. 
Um, number five, also, he learned that we can, uh, that he learned that he could, glorify, he could glorify God more with his weaknesses than with his strengths. And you know what, girls? Yes, you're not perfect. Yes, you're not. Everything is not everything you wish it would be. But God will use those weaknesses and use those in, in, in the inadequacies um, to help you understand how much of his strength that you need. Um, because he doesn't need you to be perfect. He just needs you to give what you are to him. So, I have, um, that's kind of an introduction to this. And I didn't read my purse. Um, does anyone have any money on you? Do you have a dollar? Or a ten or a five or yeah, just can I get I just want it to show. I, I need a loan. <laughs> okay, that's this will work. She's got it. Okay, I have a hundred dollar bill right here. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's a rich girl back Okay, okay I got this hundred dollar bill. Now I'm gonna give this hundred dollar bill away. You see how these go, right? It's not my hundred dollar bill. I'm gonna give this hundred dollar bill away. Um, how many of you would like to <coughs> receive this $100 bill? Would you like a $100 bill? Raise your hand. You want to receive it? Are you sure? Are you sure you want to receive it? Is there anyone that you, you're not, you don't care? They don't want it. Okay. We're all in the right? Well. <coughs>
told you that I wanted you, all that you just, and some of, all of you have some of you love too. I wanted you to let that person be lied about, to be to be stripped naked and shamed and tortured so that you can save someone who doesn't even like you <coughs> from destruction. Would you want to would you want to do that? That person you love so much? If you had to save the person who you love or save the person who doesn't even care about you, who would you choose to save? Do you know who God chooses to save? Not the person who loves so much. You choose to save you who didn't even care about you. That's how much he loves you. You can't earn God's love. And you can't do anything to lose God's love. He loves you. And the reason we love him, if, we, if anyone in here loves God, it, it's probably because you realize how much he loves you. You are so important to him. So you're worth so much that he gave his son to die for your sins. Um, also, you're worth so much. I love this one. That God has made you a joint heir with Christ. Now think of Jesus. Where, where is Jesus right now? Who can tell me where he is right now? Where? He's on the right hand of God in heaven. And he is ruling and reigning. He's going to rule and reign. He's going to come back to earth someday. And he's going to set up his kingdom. And he's going to rule and reign. And do you know what? What belongs to Jesus? The whole world is going to belong to him. Is there anything that doesn't belong to God? And do you know what you are? When you receive Christ as your Savior, you are a joint heir. Do you know what that means? That means everything that belongs to him will belong to you. Now, let you, can your mind wrap itself around that? You are going to be <coughs> co-owners of everything with Christ. You're an heir. If I die and I left all three dollars of my savings to somebody, <laughs> to let's say, okay, let's say I have, I have five dollars, I have four dollars, and I have four kids. So each child is my heir. So each child will get four dollars. We'll get a dollar each, right? So that's about all we're gonna get. <laughs> but with your joint heirs with Christ. God owns the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth, and he, he owns the cattle on a thousand hill. He owns everything. That means that you are going to have that. Do you know that? When we get to heaven, we can't even imagine what it's going to be like. That's how much God loves you. It's all yours. Why would you choose anything else? He died for you. He, you're enjoying everything. And look at this. You also, oh, I should have read the verse. Join there, so we should join there. Um, let's see. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. Is it on your paper? Okay, read it later. I don't need to read it to you. Um, he has taken you on as his personal project. Now, let's go back to what we think of ourselves. How many of you say, I think I might have just a little bit of room for improvement in my life. Does anyone feel that way? Yes. Okay. So, do you know what you are? You are God's own personal project. He is working on you. It says in first. Uh, it says in Ephesians two ten. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that He would. That we should walk in them. God says, you know what? You are not all that I want you to be yet. I'm working on you. I love you so much, I'm not going to let you stay 
dissatisfied, wishing you were better, wishing you could improve, I'm going to help you get there. That's what he says. Because he loves you. He loves you so much. He cares about you. Um, now, how do you improve your self-image and self-acceptance? First of all, number one, saturate yourself with God's love. The Lord hath appeared of, of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Girls, don't listen to the devil. Don't listen to your friends or your enemies, which they would be if they were telling you, putting you down. You need to understand you are unconditionally loved by God. And it does not matter what anybody, it doesn't matter what you feel. You're loved by God. And you need to realize how important that is. And saturate yourself in His love. Also do this. Confess your sins and accept God's forgiveness. Do you know why sometimes we struggle with who we are? It's because we're not right with God. And we're, we have all this guilt in our life. Because we're carrying this guilt because we won't get right with God. We won't do the right thing. We've done wrong things and we won't just say, God, I'm sorry. So God says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, number three, understand that you are unique and special. I decided a long time ago that God gave me the home that he did for a purpose. God gave me the sister I had for a purpose. God gave me freckles. Do you know all my life I didn't want freckles? I was told that if, when I grow up, my freckles would go away. They lied to me. I realized I have freckles for a reason. I realized that I, I wanted to be tall. You know my my um, girlfriend, Linda Ray, that I talked about? She was 5 foot 10. And she was this beautiful 5 foot 10. Everything looked right on her. <laughs> I have short arms. I'm like 5 foot 2. I used to be 5 foot 3, but I'm drinking. <laughs> you know, you're growing up and then you start growing down. But, um, <laughs> And I always wanted to be tall. I always wanted to look like those ladies, that those magazine that are the tall ladies that wear all those beautiful long clothes. And you know, and I look like I'm dressed in my big sister's clothes when I put those styles on. But you know what? I am the size that I'm supposed to be. There was no mistakes when God made you. You are exactly who you're supposed to be. And there's a reason. And when you accept that, and you understand God loves me, and God is good, and He made me who I am, it will help you understand that you're unique and you're special. Now, I'm just talking about the outside stuff. The inside stuff is even more important. All of you have something to offer this world that I could never offer. Each one of you has something to offer that the person next to you could never offer. You have something. God has made you unique and special. Maybe you have a way of understanding people. Maybe you have an efficiency about you. I mean, there is a, a plan God has for your life, and you have everything you need to fulfill His will. You know, we talk about your destiny. Your destiny is God's will. And God has put within you everything you need. And everything even that has happened to you, God says that all things work together for good to them that love God. But you are unique and special. <coughs> Psalms 39, 14 says, For I am I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, that my soul knoweth right well. Girls, the next time you don't like how you look, you don't like how you're shaped, or you don't like <coughs> your personality, I'm not saying you can't improve on those things, but I'm saying realize that you are unique and you are special. Change the things you can change and accept the things that you can't change. Number four, learn to use your unique God-given 
gifts to help others. Because that's what it's all about anyway. I feel that people who really, really, really struggle with uh, self-image, often if the flip side of that really is selfishness. They think way too much about themselves and about how they feel. But if you take who you are and try to make other people's lives happy, let me ask you this. We're always so concerned about how them. How many of you really love beautiful people anyway? I mean, the perfect, the perfect girl who's so perfect. Her hair is so perfect. Her eyelashes are so perfect. Her complexion is so perfect. Her figure is so perfect. Do you really like her? No. <laughs> Why do we want to be that person? Nobody really wants to be around. But you know what? You know who we love? People who love us. People who are kind to us. People who are thoughtful. People who treat us nice. People who make us feel good about ourselves. Those people have so many friends. Those people are loved and cared about. And you know what? We can all do that. Can we all change our, can we all get rid of our freckles if we have freckles? No. I, oh, you know what else I want? I am white as white can be. My mother was Irish, and I just have the white skin. But I grew up around a lot of Native American Indian people, where we lived up in the mountains in Northern California. They have the most beautiful skin. The beautiful, dark, you Mexican girls, you that beautiful, Skin. So beautiful. And I was convinced if I laid in the sun long enough, I would get brown like all my friends. And you know what I did? I just got a million more freckles and turned beet red. <laughs> all that happened. And you know what I said? I'm supposed to be white and freckled. That's God's will for me. And that won't change how people like me or don't like me one bit. That won't change if God can use me or not use me one bit. Why am I majoring, majoring on that? How I treat people, that's what makes me worth something. <coughs> and that's what will make you worth something. Is we'll take who we are and we'll say, God, help me to make someone else's day a better day. Help me, I have a unique, you have, you do. You think, you're thinking, I don't have anything unique. Yes, you do. There's something you can do better than most people, or the most people that don't have your gift. You have a gift some people need. Mm -hmm. And just ask God, help me to know how to take what I am and who I am and use it to make other, the lives of others better. And when we do that, we stop thinking about ourselves, we start being happy with who we are, and we become a person that people love and people like to be around. Nobody likes to be around someone who's only thinking about themselves. Oh, I got a pimple. Oh, this dress doesn't fit right. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. I always say the stupidest things. Well, maybe we do say stupid things once in a while. That just means learn and try not to say it again. Sometimes it's better just not to say anything. <laughs> I, I don't like chit chat. You know, some people are really good talkers. They're very good, and I like to be around those good talkers because I just let them do all the talking. <laughs> but if I try to be a good talker and I try to, to talk a lot when there's really nothing to talk a lot about, I almost end up saying something I don't like what I said. So don't force yourself into being someone you're not. Find out who you are. Everyone has a different gift. You know, some of you are more, some of you are good with words. So how many, is everyone in here that you know, I don't want you to say names, but is there someone in here you know someone who you like to talk, they make you feel good when you're around them, they, they have good words. Raise your hand. You know. See? <clears throat> is there anyone in here that there's people that are kind of, you know people that are kind of thoughtful, like they think about maybe writing a note or giving a little gift, and they're just a thoughtful person. They remember things that people like. You know anybody like that? Right. Um, how many of you know people that um, if you they're just like a servant. If, if you if something needs done, they're kind of the one that's there to do it. Something if they can help, they can be there to be a helper. That's that's one of the 
contributions they give. They maybe not, don't not always talk a lot, maybe they don't even give a lot of gifts, but they would be there to be the one if there's a need to fulfill that need. Anybody know people like that? See, we all will fit in this world. You know, we can't all be good talkers. Somebody has to listen, or it'll frustrate the good talkers if there's no one to listen, right? And there has to be somebody who's the thoughtful person to encourage the people. Now, I'm not saying that if you're not good at something, you can't keep working at it. But you need to accept yourself and realize you are who you are. And I don't think you should be a rat and expect, expect everyone else to expect you and to accept you. You know what I'm saying? I, I know we can get into this attitude of, well, I'm, this is just who I am. You need to expect it and respect me. I mean, you need to accept me. No, we don't. If you're being a, a, a grump and if you're being not a good person, we don't have to accept you. But I'm not saying that. But I am saying you need to accept your limitations and your weaknesses and your personality. You have strengths and you have weaknesses. And God doesn't care about them. Do you know that? God cares about you giving who you are to Him. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. I want to encourage you not to think so much about how you feel about yourself, but think about how you can make someone else's life a better life. And you can, because God has made you special. And I know He has because He said He did. He said you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And he said, from the time you were in your mother's womb, he was creating you to fulfill the purpose he has for your life. And so don't let this, I'm not good at this, I'm not good at this, I'm not good at this, get you, keep you from being a God wants you Because it doesn't matter what you're good at. It matters what he's good at. And he has a plan for you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we do thank you for how good you are to us. And and that you love us. Lord, we don't always love each other. When we have a war that shows up, and when we have something that comes up that is kind of irritating, but you never, you never stop loving us. You always are there for us. And we, I pray you help these good girls to know how much you love them and how they can be somebody for you if they would give their heart to you. In your name we pray. Okay, girls, I know this is a tight time. Yes. So we were talking about our sick girls.